In this presentation, we're going to talk about absorption systems. Now, we put this into the advanced refrigeration course because absorption has been traditionally used for process cooling and large chiller and industrial cooling. However, this is sort of a mix now of absorption systems are starting to show up in residential and light commercial air conditioning as well. So this is almost a cross between the air conditioning and the um, refrigeration. However, you need to be aware of absorption systems, especially if you are going to be doing any transport refrigeration. If you're working on an area where power is a constant problem or if you're dealing with recreational vehicles, because we see a lot of the absorption systems, smaller type absorption system in RVs and mobile units because of power and power needs. So compression refrigeration systems use the mechanical energy of compression to achieve the pressure levels needed for refrigeration. Absorption systems use heat energy instead of mechanical energy to achieve refrigeration. Absorption, if you look it up in the dictionary, it's defined as a phenomenon in which one substance, an absorbent, attracts and combines with another substance, usually a refrigerant, to form a uniform solution. In order to accomplish temperature and pressures, Absorption systems use chemicals with specific characteristics. Substances with the right properties can be used as refrigerants and absorbents. As we already know, a refrigerant is a substance that transfers heat from a conditioned space to an unconditioned space. An absorbent is a substance that soaks up or absorbs a refrigerant and lowers their combined pressure. Different combinations of substances can be used as an absorbent and a refrigerant pair, depending on how the substances interact. If one of the substances tends to absorb the others, it is said to have an affinity for the substance. Affinity is defined as the tendency of a substance to absorb another substance. This is a characteristic that's used in determining refrigerant and absorbent pairing. In absorbent chillers, the refrigerant is typically water, and the absorbent is typically in the form of sodium. In some systems, the refrigerant is ammonia, and water is the absorbent. The way a substance reacts to each other determines their use as a refrigerant or absorbent in a given absorption system. When an absorbent becomes saturated with the refrigerant, it's called a strong solution. A strong solution carry contains as much refrigerant as possible. When the mixture is not fully saturated, it's referred to as a weak solution. A weak solution contains less refrigerant than a strong solution and is capable of absorbing additional refrigerant. So when we have ammonia, which is the refrigerant, and water in equal amounts as the absorbent, we have what's called a strong solution. It's strong in refrigerant. When we have a little bit of ammonia as the refrigerant and a lot of water as the absorbent, it's a weak solution. It's weak in refrigerant. The basic absorbent refrigerant cycle is, has some similarities to a compression system, but also some significant differences. A system can be divided into four sections. You have a generator, you have a condenser, you have an evaporator, and you have an absorber. And here's sort of the four sections. Okay, the generator has a heat source. Then it goes to the condenser, where it condenses. Then it goes to an evaporator, and then it goes back to the absorber, and then back to the generator. It is a cycle, and the refrigerant which is the ammonia, has both a vapor and a liquid state, and the absorber solution has a strong and a weak absorber solution. In an absorption system, the evaporator condenser of perform essentially the same functions as they do in a compression system. In a compression system, the compressor changes the low-pressure vapor to high-pressure vapor. 
In an absorption fish system, the function of the compressor is performed by the generator, which heats the refrigerant, raising its pressure. We still have a temperature-pressure relationship. Then the absorber combines the refrigerant vapor from the solution, lowering its pressure. And the pump recirculates the refrigerant from the absorber to the generator. So we are still dealing with compressor with pressure points. We are still dealing with vapor liquid trend and the latent heat of those changes. An absorption system under operates under two pressures. The high side pressure consisting of the generator and the condenser operates at a pressure of any place from 200 pounds per square inch to 300 pounds per square inch, and that's gauge pressure. The low side pressure consists of the absorber and evaporator and operates between 40 and 60 PSIG. The high and low sides are separated by check valves, liquid traps, a pump, and other controlling devices. A generator is warmed by a heat source. The heat causes the refrigerant to boil out of the refrigerant absorbent solution. In other words, if we have a mix of water and ammonia, we heat the water and allow the, we heat the mixture and the ammonia comes out of the solution. The refrigerant vapor rises to the top of the generator and flows to the condenser. At the same time, some of the solution at the bottom of the generator passes through an orifice and then flows to the absorber. The orifice reduces the pressure on the solution, therefore dropping its temperature. The solution flowing into the absorber is once again able to absorb the refrigerant. In the condenser section, heat is removed from the refrigerant vapor by cooling by the cooling media, water or air, causing the refrigerant vapor to condense into a liquid. The high pressure in the condenser drives the liquid refrigerant into the evaporator through an orifice. Water passes through the evaporator. Water flowing through the tubes absorbs heat from the conditioned space and carries it to the evaporator. In the evaporator section, the heat from that circulating water is absorbed into the refrigerant. This lowers the temperature of the water, and then the chilled water is then recirculated to the conditioned space. So the air handlers in the conditioned space or the evaporators used in process cooling actually are water cooled. They don't have refrigerant in direct contact. It's not a direct expansion system. It is a chiller. It's so you have water in the coils. The heat is then absorbed by the liquid refrigerant in the evaporator from the chilled water circuit causes the refrigerant to boil back to a vapor. The refrigerant vapor is drawn back to the absorber and is cooled by the flow of the weak solution coming from the generator. In the absorber, the heat in the refrigerant vapor is transferred to the surface of the absorber and then to the outside air, causing the refrigerant to condense again. The strong solution is formed again at the bottom of the absorber and is pumped back to the generator by the pump, and then the process starts all over again. You have several types of absorption systems. Chillers are the primary application of absorption refrigeration systems. Absorption chillers use the heat energy from a flame or a heating element to complete the refrigeration cycle. Chillers are used in both air conditioning and industrial process cooling. Absorption systems are used in industrial refrigeration, air conditioning, domestic and recreational vehicle refrigeration. Absorption systems are usually classified by their operation cycle. We have intermittent systems or we have continuous systems. Intermittent systems are exactly that, absorption systems that operate intermittently. Often one charge of fuel will operate the generator for a short period of time that will run the system for about a day. Intermittent absorption systems usually are usually limited to places where other adequate, consistent sources of power are unavailable. Continuous cycle absorption systems operate by an application of limited amount of heat. The heat is supplied by electricity, gas, or kerosene. These types of systems are used in domestic refrigerators, in recreational vehicles, in year-round air conditioning of homes and larger buildings. The number of absorption air conditioning systems used in residential and commercial buildings has increased. 
The refrigerant most commonly used in these systems is ammonia and water, where ammonia is the refrigerant and water is the absorbent. Be very careful when you're servicing these systems. Ammonia is a breathing and inhalation hazard. Larger commercial systems may use water as the refrigerant and liquid bromide as the absorbent. You don't see those that often. Absorption systems have a number of heat sources that are used, including natural gas, LP, kerosene, steam, and electricity. You also are starting to see more and more solar based absorption systems out there, especially in the South. This is an example of a residential chiller air conditioning system. Okay, now the next couple slides are going to walk you through this. What I want you to do, and we'll come back to this, is pay attention to the numbers here. We're going to start with number one, okay? So pay attention to the numbers that are in the red circles. How does this work? Let's walk it through. The generator has a gas burner that heats the mixture of ammonia and water. The boiling point of the ammonia is lower than the water, and therefore the ammonia evaporates and flows through the line marked 1 on the picture that I just showed you. As the ammonia vapor passes through the rectifier, some of it condenses and is returned to the generator. So again, we have number 1. The ammonia, okay, is heats up, okay, and some of it is, and it condenses, some of it comes out and comes this way to number, towards number two, some of it falls down and is passed back to the generator. The remaining ammonia vapor passes to the condenser marked two on your handout. At this point, it's at a high temperature high pressure gas. Sounds familiar? As the outside air passes over the condenser, it removes heat from the ammonia and condenses the ammonia to a liquid and passes through the line to the refrigerant heat exchanger marked three on your handout. This heat exchanger is also known as a pre-cooler. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so again, we're here at number two, okay, and this has now, this is condensing. Again, we're going from the beige to the yellow. Okay, and we're now passing through number three to my refrigerant heat exchanger. Okay, so we're now passing through this area. The heat exchanger reduces the temperature of the liquid ammonia before the ammonia reaches the evaporator. It heats the cold ammonia vapor, leaving the evaporator through line four on your handout. The pressure drops as the liquid ammonia leaving the heat exchanger passes through the evaporator restriction, restrictor into the evaporator. Here it picks up heat from the chilled water system and boils the ammonia into a vapor. So again, we're now at number four, okay? We're in the evaporator. The ammonia passes through here. The water's coming around, the hot water's coming around it, and it's coming down, and it's boiling off into a vapor, okay? And it's now coming out, point number four. Ammonia vapor in line four passes through the heat exchanger where it absorbs heat from the refrigerant coming out of the compressor. After passing through the heat exchanger, the ammonia vapor passes through the solution cooled absorber, 0.5. It flows through the restrictor, which meters the flow and separates the high and the low pressure side of your hand system. Look at points 5 and 6. So we are now here in 5. Okay, there's the solution absorber. Comes down. Okay, and we're now at number 6. There's our solution restrictor. As the weak solution passes from point 6 into the absorber, where the solution temperature is lowered by transferring heat to the vapor in the absorber, the weak solution absorbs the low-pressure ammonia vapor coming from the evaporator, increases the concentration of ammonia in the solution to the bottom of the absorber. 
The solution then travels from the absorber to the condenser where it loses heat. Okay, so again, we're now at point six and it travels from the absorber back to the condenser. Okay, so we're, we're now in our absorber over here. Okay, and it's going to go back to the condenser where it loses heat. Okay, we're at this point now. We've lost heat. As it loses heat, the ability to absorb additional ammonia is decreased, so it becomes a strong solution. The strong solution leaves the condenser and is carried to the solution pump through line 7. The pump forces it to a high pressure to the rectifier through line 8. The strong solution then flows to the absorber through line 9 where it absorbs additional heat. So we're now at line 7. Okay, we flow back through the pump, which increases the pressure through line 8, and then flows through line 9. The preheated solution returns through line 10 to the generator. So now we are at line 10, which is right here, the green line, returns to the generator where the cycle starts all over. Now this is a picture of a residential absorption system combined with a typical forced air furnace. What they basically done is we just put a water cooler on top. Instead of a DX coil, we have a water cooler. Now, here's the thing, okay? The reason these systems are used more and more, and we're seeing some more of these, is because it doesn't take a lot of power to operate, okay? I live in Florida where we have we air condition basically year-round. Okay, um, it's when I'm doing this video, it's already December. I'm still running the air conditioning because the outside temperatures and the humidity is much too high to not be running it. My solar panels on the roof will handle my air conditioning during the daytime hours. However, it during the nighttime hours, it takes about three kilowatts per hour of um of power to operate my air conditioning. So we just have to be aware of how much power this whole thing takes. So if we can use less power, I don't have to drive a compressor. I just have to drive the fans and the pump, okay, that and the air handler. So that pumping action and that fan action will be probably, um, if let's see, probably less than about five amps. Compared with my compressor that pulls about 16 or 17 amps when it's running at high load. So that's an absorption system overview. If you ever find yourself working on absorption systems, find the service manuals, call the tech support line, and get some training from your company directly.